Chapter Forty Two of Arema. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Dodge. Arema by R. D. Blackmore. Chapter Forty Two. Master Withypool. At first, I was much inclined to run for help, or at least for counsel either to Lord Castlewood or to Major Hawken. But further consideration kept me from doing anything of the kind. In the first place, neither of them would do much good, for my cousin's ill health would prevent him from helping me, even if his strange view of the case did not, while the excellent Major was much too hot and hasty for a delicate task like this, and again I might lose the most valuable and important of all chances by being away from the spot just now, and so I remained at Shoxford for a while, keeping strict watch upon the stranger's haunt, and asking about him by means of Mrs. Busk. "'I have heard more about him, miss,' she said one day, when the down letters had been dispatched, which happened about middle day. He has been here only those three times this summer, upon excuse of fishing always. He stays at Old Wellham, about five miles down the river, where the people are not true Moonites. And one thing that puzzles them is that although he puts up there simply for the angling, he always chooses times when the water is so low that to catch fish is next to impossible. He left his fishing quarters upon the very day after you saw him searching so, and he spoke as if he did not mean to come again this season. And they say they don't want him neither. He is such a morose, close-fisted man, and drinking nothing but water, there is very little profit with him. And did you find out what his name is? How cleverly you have managed! He passes by the name of quote, Captain Brown, unquote. but the landlord of the inn, who has been an old soldier, is sure he was never in the army, nor any other branch of the service. He thinks that he lives by inventing things, for he is always at some experiments, and one of his great points is to make a lamp that will burn and move about under water. To be sure, you see the object of that, miss. No, really, Mrs. Busk, I cannot. I have not your penetration. Why, of course, to find what he cannot find upon land. There is something of great importance there, either for its value or its meaning. Have you ever been told that your poor grandfather wore any diamonds or precious jewels? No, I have asked about that most especially. He had nothing about him to tempt a robber. He was a very strong-willed man, and he hated outward trumpery. Then it must be something that this man himself has dropped, unless it were a document or any other token missing from his lordship, and few things of that sort would last for twenty years almost. Nineteen years the day after tomorrow, I answered, with a glance at my pocket-book. I determined to be here on that very day. No doubt I am very superstitious, but one thing I cannot understand is this. What reason can there have been for his letting so many years pass and then hunting like this? No one can answer that question, miss, without knowing more than we know. But many reasons might be supposed. He might have been roving abroad, for instance, just like you and her father have been. Or he might not have known that thing was there, or it might not have been of importance until lately, or he might have been afraid until something else has happened. Does he know that you are now in England? How can I possibly tell, Mrs. Busk? He seems to know a great deal too much. He found me out when I was at Colonel Gundry's. At least I conclude so, from what I know now, but I hope he does not know and at such a dreadful idea, I shuddered. I am almost sure that he cannot know it, 
the good postmistress answered, or he would have found means to put an end to you. That would have been his first object. But, Mrs. Busk, I said, being much disturbed by her calmness, surely, surely he is not to be allowed to make an end of every one? I came to this country with the full intention of going into everything, but I did not mean at all, except in my very best moments, to sacrifice myself. It seems too bad, too bad to think of. So it is, Miss Arema, Mrs. Busk replied, without any congenial excitement. It does seem hard for them that has the liability on them. But still, miss, you have always shown such a high sense of duty, and of what you were about. I can't, I cannot. There are times, I do assure you, when I am fit for nothing, Mrs. Busk, and I wish myself back in America. And if this man is to have it all his own way... Not he, miss, not he. Be you in no hurry. Could he even have his way with our old miller? No. Master Withypool was too many for him. Well, that is a new thing. You never told me that. What did he try to do with the miller? I don't justly know what it was, Miss Arema. I never spoke to Miller about it, and indeed I have had no time since I heard of it. But those that told me said that the tall, strange gentleman was terribly put out and left the gate with a black cloud upon his face and the very next day the miller's daughter died, quite sudden and mysterious. How very strange! But now I've got a new idea. Has the miller a strong high dam to his pond and a good stout sluice gate at the end? Yes, miss, to be sure he has, said Mrs. Busk. Otherwise how could he grind at all, when the river is so low as it is sometimes? Then I know what he wanted and I will take a leaf out of his own book, the miscreant. He wanted the miller to stop back the water and leave the pool dry at the, quote, murder bridge, unquote. Would it be possible for him to do that? I cannot tell you, miss, but your thought is very clever. It is likely enough that he did want that, though he would never dare to ask without some pretense. Some other cause I mean to show for it. He may have been thinking that, whatever he was wanting was likely to be under water and that shows another thing if it is so mrs busk my head goes round with such a host of complications i do my best to think them out and then there comes another no miss this only clears things up a little if the man cannot be sure whether what he is looking for is on land or under water it seems to me almost to show that it was lost at the murder time in the dark and flurry a man would know if he dropped anything in the water by daylight from the splash and the ripple and so on for the stream is quite slow at that corner he dropped it miss when he did the deed or else it came away from his lordship nothing was lost as i said before from the body of my grandfather so far at least as our knowledge goes whatever was lost was the murderers now please to tell me all about the miller and how i may get round him you make me laugh in the middle of black things miss by the way you have a putting them but as to the miller master withypool is a wonder as concerns the ladies he is one of those men that stand up for everything when a man tries upper side of them but little woman come and get up under, and there he is a pie crust lifted. Why, I at my age could get round him, as you call it. But you, miss, and more than that, you are something like his daughter. And the old man frets after her terrible. Go you into his yard and just smile upon him, miss. And if the moon river can be stopped, he'll stop it for you. This seemed a very easy way to do it, but I told Mrs. Busk that I would pay well also, for the loss of a day's work at the mill was more than fifty smiles could make up. But she told me, above all things, not to do that. Her old master Withypool was of that sort, that he would stand for an hour with his hands in his pocket for a halfpenny. 
if not justly owing from him but nothing more angered him than a bribe to step outside of his duty he had plenty of money and was proud of it but sooner would he lose a day's work to do a kindness when he was sure of having right behind it than take a week's profit without earning it and very likely that was where the dark man failed from presuming that money would do everything however there was nothing like judging for oneself and if i would like to be introduced she could do it for me with the best effect taking as she did a good hundredweight of her best quote, households unquote, from him every week although not herself in the baking line but always keeping quartern bags because the new baker did adulterate so i thought of her father and how things work around but that they would do without remarks of mine so i said nothing on that point but asked whether master withypool would require any introduction and to this mrs busk said oh dear no and her throat had been a little rough since sunday and the dog was chained tight even if any dog would bite a sweet young lady and to her mind the miller would be more taken up and less fit to vapor into obstacles if i were to hit upon him all alone just when he came out to the bank of his cabbage garden not so very long after his dinner to smoke his pipe and to see his things a growin it was time to get ready if i meant to catch him then for he always dined at one o'clock and the mill was some three or four meadows up the stream therefore as soon as mrs busk had reassured me that she was quite certain of my enemy's departure i took my drawing things and set forth to call upon master withypool passing through the churchyard which was my nearest way and glancing sadly at the fairy ring i began to have some uneasiness about the possible issue of my new scheme such a thing required more thinking out than i had given to it for instance what reason could i give the miller for asking so strange a thing of him and how could the whole of the valley be hindered from making the greatest talk about the stoppage of their own beloved moon even if the moon could be stopped without every one of them rushing down to see it and if it was so talked of would it not be certain to come to the ears of that awful man and if so how long before he found me out and sent me to rejoin my family these thoughts compelled me to be more discreet and having lately done a most honorable thing in refusing to read that letter i felt a certain right to play a little trick now of purely harmless character i ran back therefore to my writing desk and took from its secret drawer a beautiful golden american eagle a large coin larger and handsomer than any in the english coinage uncle sam gave it to me on my birthday and i would not have taken fifty pounds for it with this i hurried to that bridge of fear which i had not yet brought myself to go across and then not to tell any story about it i snipped a little hole in the corner of my pocket while my hand was still steady ere i had to mount the bridge then pinching that hole up with a little squeeze i ran and got upon that wicked bridge and then let go the heavy gold coin fell upon the rotten plank and happily rolled into the water as if it were glad not to tempt its makers to any more sin for the sake of it shutting up thought for fear of despising myself for the coinage of such a little trick i hurried across the long meadow to the mill and went through the cow gate into the yard and the dog began to bark at me seeing that he had a strong chain on i regarded him with lofty indignation do you know what jowler would do to you i said jowler a dog worth ten of you he would take you by the neck and drop you into that pond for daring to insult his mistress the dog appeared to feel the force of my remarks for he lay down again and with one eye watched me in a manner amusing but insidious then taking good care to keep out of his reach i went to the mill pond and examined it it looked like a very nice pond indeed 
long and large and well banked up not made into any particular shape but producing little rushy elbows the water was now rather low and very bright though the moon itself is not a crystal stream and a school of young minnows just watching a water spider with desirous awe at sight of me broke away and reunited with a speed and a precision that might shame the whole of our very best modern fighting then many other things made a dart away and furrowed the shadow of the willows till distance quieted the fear of man that most mysterious thing in nature and the shallow pool was at peace again and bright with unruffled reflections what ails the dog said a deep gruff voice and the poor dog received a contemptuous push not enough to hurt him but to wound his feelings for doing his primary duty servant miss what can i do for you footpath is to other side of that there hedge yes but i left the footpath on purpose i came to have a talk with you if you will allow me sartin sartin the miller replied lifting a broad flowery hat and showing a large gray head will you come to the house miss or into the garden i chose the garden and he led the way and set me down upon an old oak bench where the tinkle of the water through the floodgates could be heard so you be to come to paint the mill at last he said many a time i looked out for you the young leddy down to mother busks of course many's the time we've longed for you to come you reminds me so of somebody why my old missus can't set eyes on you in church miss without being forced to sit down a most but we thought it very pretty of you not to come miss while the trouble was so new upon us something in my look or voice made the old man often turn away while i told him that i would make the very best drawing of his mill that i could manage and would beg him to accept it her ought a been on the plank he said with trouble getting his words out but there what good her will never stand on that plank no more no nor any other plank i told him that i would put her on the plank if he had any portrait of her showing her dress and her attitude without saying what he had he led me to the house and stood behind me while i went inside and then he could not keep his voice as i went from one picture of his darling to another not thinking as i should have done of what his feelings might be but trying as no two were alike at all to extract a general idea of her nobody knows what her were to me the old man said with a quiet noise and a sniff behind my shoulder and with one day's illness her died her died but you have others left she was not the only one please mr withypool to try to think of that and your dear wife still alive to share your trouble just think for a moment of what happened to my father his wife and six children all swept off in a month and i just born to be brought up with a bottle i never meant of course to have said a word of this but was carried away by that common old idea of consoling great sorrow with a greater one and the sense of my imprudence broke vexatiously upon me when the old man came and stood between me and his daughter's portraits well i never he exclaimed with his bright eyes steadfast with amazement i know you now miss now i knows you to think what a set of blind newts us must be and you the very moral of your poor father in in a female kind of way to be sure how well i knew the captain a nicer man never walked the earth neither a more unlucky one oh i beg you let me beg you i began to say since you have found me out like this hush miss hush not my own wife shall know unless your own tongue telleth her a proud man i shall be miss raumer he continued with emphasis on my local name if aught can be find in my power to serve you why lord bless you miss he whispered looking around your father and i has spent hours together he were that pleasant in his ways and words he would drop in from his fishing when the water was too low and sit on that very same bench where you sat and smoke his pipe with me and tell me about battles and ask me about bread and many a time i've slipped up to the gate to give him more water for his flies to play 
and the fish not to see him so plainly. Ah, we've had many a pleasant spells together, and his eldest boy and girl, Master George and Miss Henrietta, used to come and fetch our eggs. My Polly there was in love with them, we said. She sat upon his lap so, when she were two years old and played with his beautiful hair and blubbered. Oh, she did blubber when the captain went away. This invested Polly with new interest for me, and made me determined to spare no pains in putting her pretty figure well upon the plank. Then I said to the miller, "'How kind of you to draw up your sluice skates to oblige my father. Now will you put them down, and keep them down to do a great service both to him and me?' Without a moment's hesitation, he promised that anything he could do should be done, if I would only tell him what I wanted. But perhaps it would be better to have our talk outside. Taking this hint, I followed him back to the bench in the open garden, and there explained what I wished to have done, and no longer concealed the true reason. The good miller answered that with all his heart he would do that much to oblige me, and a hundred times more than that but some little thought and care were needful. With the river so low as it was now, he could easily stop the backwater and receive the whole of the current in his dam, and keep it from flowing down his wheel trough, and thus dry the lower channel for perhaps half an hour, which would be ample for my purpose. Engineering difficulties there were none, but two or three other things must be heeded. Miller Sims, a mile or two down river, must be settled with, to fill his dam well and to begin to discharge when the upper water failed, so as not to dry the moon all down the valley, which would have caused a commotion. Miller Sims being his own brother-in-law to Master Withypool, that could be arranged easily enough after one day's notice. But a harder thing to manage would be to do the business without rousing curiosity, and setting abroad a rumor which would sh be sure to reach my enemy. And the hardest thing of all, said Master Withypool, smiling as he thought of what himself had once been, would be to keep those blessed boys away who find out everything and go everywhere. Not a boy of Shoxford, but that would be in the river, dancing upon its empty bed, screeching and scalloping up into his hat, any poor bewildered trout chased into the puddles, if it were allowed to leak out, however feebly that the moon water was to stop running. And then how was I to seek for anything? This was a puzzle, but with counsel we did solve it, and we quietly stopped the moon without man or boy being much the wiser. End of chapter 42